What's going on, everyone? Mike O here, joined by my buddy Ed, a.k.a. Wesker Griff, on YouTube. We're here on the Mike O Baseball Vlog channel today, and maybe we'll toss this up somewhere else. We're doing a uh, kind of just throwing together a podcast, no preparation, just providing some feelings on the conclusion of the Major League Baseball season, specifically that of the Philadelphia Phillies who finished up the 2020 campaign with a disappointing 28-32 and 32 record, finishing in third place in the National League East. And in a year of expanded playoffs, they did not qualify. So certainly disappointing. I'm sure Ed will agree. We're both thrilled that we did get baseball this year. We had that opportunity to watch some Phillies baseball, but it did not go the way uh, we would expect or want it. And... You know what? We're going to have some frustrations. We're going to talk about it for a little while here. Just get it off our chest. It's definitely better than holding it in and just being uh, frustrated. As as big baseball fans, we're certainly still excited to see the Major League Baseball playoffs coming up. Should be really interesting to see the new format. Just disappointed that the Philadelphia Phillies, for the what ninth consecutive year, will not participate. With all that being said, Ed, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me on, Mike. I wish we were talking about better circumstances with the Phillies, uh, with playoff baseball, but it is what it is. And uh, it was not a great season for the Phillies. Was extremely glad that we had baseball in 2020, but the way that the Phillies played in September and the way the bullpen pitched this year, it was torture. So there's a lot to go over in this podcast, a lot to discuss. And like you mentioned, we're just, we didn't really do too much research uh, for this particular thing. We're just going on what we watched the entire season. And this is kind of, kind of going to be some of our hot takes. You said it is what it is and what it is, is disappointing specifically because of the the expanded postseason. And listen, we both watched baseball for a long time. We understand it is a 60-game season, and that has pluses and minuses. Um, obviously, we're just happy to get a season in. When you have a shorter season, you have less you know margin for error. You have less time to kind of find your groove. If they played a full 162, there's going to be ups and downs, and the teams that qualified for the postseason probably would have changed because you would have just had a longer uh, amount of time for teams to improve, teams to kind of make adjustments and such, find their grooves, but that's just not the season we had this year. And, you know, the Phillies, $200 plus million dollar payroll, highest in team history. I think they were seventh in Major League Baseball, and they're just so top-heavy, and that's, you know... That's the frustrating part. And the September collapse, which we've become way too accustomed to over the last few years, is another thing that is uh, just utterly disappointing. Uh, and it's very frustrating. I mean, they literally had to do so little in the final week. They had to win one more game. They had to go 2-7 and seven in their final nine, or their final eight, 2-6. and six. They won one game. Everything lined up in that final day of the season, everything they needed to have happen happened except for them winning the game. So definitely disappointing. So many missed opportunities. Obviously the bullpen was the crux of the problem. The number one problem by far, uh, lack of depth and bullpen, uh, were the biggest problem with this team, they had what, 21 blown lead losses, which is pathetic. They had a lead in 49 of 60 games led the majors, I believe, or were tied with the Dodgers. So when you have a really bad bullpen, you're going to have a really bad team, and the Phillies had a historically bad bullpen. So, I mean, there, there's not much more frustrating than a bullpen that can never hold a lead. They basically could never hold a lead. Like, as you mentioned, they were historically the worst bullpen in baseball history. Just... Take a second to contemplate that statement. Think of all the years there's been in baseball, all the years that there's been bullpens, all the teams. <laughs> Just think about that. The way that this bullpen was constructed by the front office, it was just 
it was not good. They had veterans who just could not. It was just, it was, it was, it was real painful as a fan to watch because the Phillies offense did, they were pretty damn good this year. The Phillies offense, they put up quite a bit of runs. The starting pitcher was pretty damn strong, but every single time a pit, the starting pitcher would come out, it would just boom. The lead would evaporate and the Phillies would put up five to six runs. I think the Phillies were pretty high actually in runs per game scoring wise, but every single time. And then, they made trades. They tried to bring people in. I know they brought in Brandon Workman, which was a disaster. Uh, they brought, I think they brought in a couple other guys. I know they called up JoJo Romero, who was actually one of their better bullpen pitchers. He kind of been yeah, he had pretty a good. pretty bad game or two, so ZRA still finished over seven. So, <laughs> but David Phelps, Blake Parker, I mean, all these guys just. David Hale, oh my lord. I think going forward, looking towards 2021, there's very few guys I want to see brought back in the bullpen. I think the only guys that are salvageable in the bullpen are Connor Brogdon. He was impressive. Young guy that they called up. Jojo Romero, like I just mentioned. I thought he was pretty decent. And I really can't think of anyone else. Hector Neris, maybe. I mean, but he, there were times where it was just, yeah, it was there, rough. Before you can get to the, uh, you know, the guys on the field, you got to figure out what you're doing in the front office. Uh, we are recording this very early Tuesday morning. So Monday came and went, no movement, no uh, type of move by the organization. And generally speaking, Major League Baseball kind of frowns upon making moves and making newsworthy moves to take attention away from the on-field games once the postseason begins. So that makes you wonder, are they going to make a change in the front office? I mean, we have a general manager, Matt Klintak, who has been around at this point for a half a decade and has really nothing, has very little to show for himself. And you have Andy McPhail, who, I mean, I don't think there's a single person in the city of Philadelphia who likes him. I mean, so... You know, when it, is there going to be a change? If so, when would it be? You would assume it would have been today, uh, but who knows? Um, <laughs> there are philosophical issues. There's uh, top to bottom. You know, you got to, if you're a general manager, you have to get creative. You have to make good deals and you have to have an eye for talent. And this team has had bullpen issues for years. Obviously, this year is an utter disgrace. Um, it should never be as bad as it's been. Young talent is an issue. It's been an issue for a while. First-round picks, generally speaking, have not worked out. Alec Bohm uh, was one of the bright spots this year and played very, very well. He's one of the recent first-round picks. But generally speaking, first-round picks have not been very good. So, you know, there's moves you can make like Bryce Harper. Great job getting him here. But you throw money at guys, you can do it. Uh, what's going to build a winning team is making wise moves, picking up some guys, because you obviously can't overpay everyone, so you're going to have to make clever trades. You're going to have to get young guys who don't cost you a ton of money. You're going to have to bring in guys on short-term deals. That did work out with D.D. Gregorius. You're going to have to get talent, and one of the issues, obviously the bullpen, like we said before, was the biggest issue to me, and I think it really played a major role in the last week especially with that walk-off home run in Washington, that loss, a disgrace of a loss. I think at a certain point, just like it weighs on you and me as fans, where you're just like, here we go, or you don't even believe it. It's like, yay, the team's out there 3 nothing leading the first, but you're just assuming at some point it's going to be tied. I think that same thing happens with the team itself. I think you saw that late in the season as they struggled. I think you saw the starting pitchers know they had no margin for error. If they gave up a couple runs that were going to be in trouble because you knew once they were out, a couple more runs would come across. And I think the offense felt the same pressure. I mean, they did put up a decent amount of runs. They gave the team leads fairly consistently this season. And at a certain point, you're like, when's enough enough? Like, we scored five runs, but like if we don't score 10, we feel like we're in trouble. And I, I think you saw them pressing, so... I don't know. It's a mess of a situation, and the future does not look as bright as we would like it to look. There's a lot of uncertainty, unfortunately. 
because you have free agents. I they have so many holes going into the off season. They got starting pitchers leaving or on options. They got you know DD Degorius. He was on a one year deal, so he might not be back next year. You got questions at second base. You got JT Romuto, who is the best catcher in baseball, and the Phillies just made a colossal miscalculation, not re-signing him. So he's going to go to free agency, and you're going to have the Yankees, the Padres, all these big market teams with big pocketbooks trying to get JT Romuto, who is the best catcher in baseball, and now the Phillies, who gave away a young phenom for him, are are going to be we're going to be screwed because if they don't re-sign JT Realmuto, they essentially gave away Sicto Sanchez for just two years of JT Realmuto when the Phillies weren't really competing or weren't making the playoffs. So, I mean, these type of moves can really, really set back an organization doing stuff like that. Again, if you re-sign JT Realmuto, it kind of nullifies it. The getting rid of Sicto Sanchez, but I don't feel confident as a fan on September 29, 2020, that they're going to re-sign him uh, if he hits the open free agency because we're not going to be able to compete with a team like the Yankees who can throw a – they're going to throw way more money at him than we could. So – and then you got the start the start of rotation. I think next year you're going to have Aaron Nola uh, who – Aaron Ola, he's been pretty damn good the last couple of years, but as a fan, and I don't want to go too hard on Aaron Ola because he's certainly not the reason why this team uh, didn't make the playoffs, but this is the third year in a row he's kind of faltered in September, and it's a little bit concerning to me. Uh, but we're going to have Aaron Ola next year, Zach Wheeler, who was, who was really good. Zach Wheeler was very impressive, and... That's it. After that, I mean, you got, I think Jake Arrieta has a club option. I don't think there's no way you can pick up that club option. Um, I think it's for like what, like, I don't know offhand, but I think it's over 15 million club option. So you don't, you don't bring him back. You said, I guess you give him his walking papers, but then you have Zach Eflin who was good towards, who was good in September for the Phillies. He was kind of their most consistent starting pitcher, but He's been consistently inconsistent in his time with the Phillies. So to me, he's still kind of a question mark. Then you have Vince Velasquez, who finally, I'm hoping the Phillies can turn the page on uh, for starting for starting pitcher wise because I think he only had two quality starts this year, and they messed around with him last year where he only had one quality start. His ERA was over five. They they sent him to the bullpen, and it really wasn't working out. So there's just a lot of questions with these team. And as a, like I said, as a fan, it's it's really it's uh, kind of we're like Dusty Rhodes said back in the '80s during WWE. We're in for hard times. Yeah, we'll see how things work out. Uh, depth is definitely an issue with this organization and with the major league roster. Uh, certainly, injuries happen, and it's that that is another thing that did cost the Phillies a bit. Uh, Bryce Harper was playing with a injury that definitely affected him. He could play through it, but for the month of September, JT Real Muto missed a couple weeks and was certainly not the same once he did kind of force his way into the lineup for the last week or so. Reese Hoskins was on the hottest streak in like a year and a half, two years, and then he was injured and missed the last... 17 games I believe so injuries did play a role but you really need some major league caliber players to be able to fill and I'm sorry but Phil Gosson great story local guy it was fun he's a fun like 25th man that guy cannot be your starting first baseman in a must win game at the end of the season that that's a problem so they're gonna have to look to uh add some serious depth to this roster in the offseason, and listen, they got a lot of competition. You got the Atlanta Braves, who don't appear like they're going anywhere. A ton of young talent, and I mean, they won another division title despite various injuries to their starting staff. 
the Washington Nationals, rough season. But there's no reason to believe they won't be back. They have deep pockets. They have a Hall of Famer anchoring their starting rotation still. They've got perhaps the best young player in baseball that'll be back next year. Um, The Nationals could be a problem. The New York Mets have had some talent for years. They, you know, the best thing about the Mets has been uh, ownership's cheapness and their inability to, you know, consistently make the right moves or make enough moves. Well, that might change now that they're when their sale is completed and their new owner becomes the richest owner in Major League Baseball. That that's probably not going to be good news. Not to say that they can't make a mess of their teams at a certain point, but. For the time being, if you add some serious talent to that pitching staff, they could be a problem. And the Marlins are just always cranking in talent. I mean, we get it. The Miami Marlins, for the most part, are a joke of a franchise. When you consider the fact how much talent they trade prematurely because they're just fearful of paying anyone, despite the fact that they have a brand new stadium and such. But they're the type of team that can consistently put a competitive team on the field, and they can get really good in short spurts. Will they ever hold a 10-year dynasty? Unlikely, because once they get that talent in there, once they have a few years of service time, they usually uh, find their way to the door. But you do have a lot of competition in the division, and you have a lot of holes. So you need to figure out what you're doing with your front office quickly. If you believe in Matt Klintak... And that crew, so be it. But you better plan on them being around for years because you can't do this start and stop nonsense um, like they did towards the end of the Phillies' reign when they won those division titles. I mean, 2012, 2013, 2014, even going into 2015, they were still kidding themselves like they were the same team and just kept trying to patch things up. They never tore things completely down. I mean, you have enough talent right now to – Add talent and get better. You shouldn't have to do a full rebuild, but you better get going with that right away. And, you know, we'll see who's back next year. There's there's going to be uh, there's certainly going to be some holes. There are holes and there might be more. And if you lose players to division rivals, that's even more of an issue. Yeah, you were talking about Matt Clintack. I think everyone in the city of Philadelphia was absolutely dumbfounded how the Phillies didn't let him go or fire him or f- basically fire him uh, on Monday morning. I mean, the Angels, sh- sh- they didn't wait. They fired their they fired their GM the moment the game got over. So they were moving on quickly. And the thing I look at with Matt Clintech is I look at the track record. What has he done in five years? to really make me say, this is the guy going forward. He, a lot of the moves have not worked out. And the Phillies, death was such an issue this year. Death was such a bad issue this year that the Phillies had to call up Mickey Moniak from, he was in double A last year. He came up, got his major league debut, a former first round pick. And he was not ready for the majors. In a normal season, there is no way Mickey Moniak would have even got near the major league team. And I mean, that's just what it is now. They they have no they really don't have any big name prospects or minor league talent to fill some of these holes. They've just have not scouted and have not drafted right. They've just wasted a lot of years, unfortunately. And we're in a world of hurt. In a world of hurt. Yeah, we're going to see. Like the Usually you're just excited for the next season. Of course, I'll be excited once 2021 starts. Before that, though, as a baseball fan, I'm thrilled to kind of see what happens in this postseason. It is interesting seeing some different teams. And, you know, anything can happen. That best of three series, I, I wouldn't uh, – I wouldn't assume anything. You have one bad night that could cost you dearly. So that's not something teams that have excelled have had to deal with in the past. I mean, I see early predictions, everyone kind of picking the Dodgers and such. Like, do I expect them to beat Milwaukee? I do. But 
I wouldn't assume anything. I do think it's going to be fun, though. And that's another frustrating thing. You see the teams like the White Sox and the Padres, all these teams reaching the postseason with all this young talent and these teams who who steal talent. They make wise trades. And you see it all the time. You got Jordan Alvarez. He's obviously hurt this year. Straight up stolen by the Houston Astros. They stole him in a trade. You've got Fernando Tatis Jr., another one of the top players in baseball, literally stolen from the Chicago White Sox organization. Even Glaber Torres, that's how the Yankees acquired him. Again, not having an amazing year, but so much young talent. And When do the Phillies do this? It, it's virtually never. I mean, it's like once, in, once a decade they hit on a first-round pick. That's problematic. Every now and then they have a late-round guy who comes up and um, – you know, contributes, but it's a problem. And there's a lot of uncertainty, as I mentioned before, going into 2021, going right down the lineup. You got JT Real Muto, who's a free agent. When guys hit free agency, they rarely end up at the same team. It happens from time to time. It happened with Steven Strasburg last year, but it does not happen often. I think he likes Philadelphia. He's obviously buddies with Bryce Harper. I think he feels comfortable here and he'd love to be back, but guess what? He's a free agent. The union knows they got to get a strong contract. There'll be a lot of pressure on him to take the biggest and best offer uh, for multiple reasons. One, you've got this uh, collective bargaining agreement coming up. So the union's going to be very interested in getting great deals. You have Major League Baseball recently, I think it was a week or two ago, announcing another major TV contract with, I guess it was TBS. So that's just a ton more money for Major League Baseball. Major League Baseball, understandably so, losing a ton of money based on the fact that there's no fans in the stands this season. But the TV contracts, they're pretty healthy. They're very healthy. And the fact that Real Muto is a catcher, and catchers have kind of consistently been disrespected from a cost point, free agency, arbitration, stuff like that. If JT Real Muto was a first baseman, you know, he probably would have doubled his salary last year in arbitration. So he's like, he's absolutely going to sign a contract bigger than the one that Joe Maurer got years ago. And the problem is being a premium player at a premium position where there's very few available. He's great at calling games. He's great at throwing out runners. He's very good defensively and he's a fantastic offensive player. He runs well. He does everything well. Of course, teams are going to want him. The Yankees, they'll pay what they need to pay. I'm telling you right now, the Mets might outbid everyone. I've seen that the Nationals are going to express interest, the Atlanta Braves. So you have division rivals who know how good he is, just like the Phillies knew how good he was when he was in Miami. So, I mean, the odds of him coming back are not good, and he's going to get a bad contract. You expect that. You hope you get four or five good years out of him, and you just suck it up for the last two to three. The time to sign him was in the offseason, and they didn't do it. So that might be a missed opportunity. You've got uncertainty with Reese Hoskins. Is he going to be ready for next year? Are things going to heal up? Is he going to need surgery? If he does, how much time is he going to miss? I honestly thought there was a decent chance Reese Hoskins would be moved in the offseason. I thought it was a possibility. Still arbitration eligible. And I think there's still a lot of value for a guy who can be as productive as he is. At a lower salary, they might have been able to swap him for a really good starting pitcher or something like that. But who knows now? Will he be back? You know, will he be healthy? And then you really don't know what you're doing in the infield. Alec Bohm, I suppose they can toss him at third base for a year or two. I don't know if he's a third baseman long term. That's one of the reasons I thought perhaps he'd be the first baseman going forward. D.D. Gregorius, the most consistent player this year, had... You know, he played all 60 games, the only guy on the team to do such a thing. 10 homers, 40 RBIs, hit 284. I think I saw he never went more than two games without a hit. Just consistent right through. Very good player. He's definitely getting a four or five year deal. So then you're going to need a shortstop. Gene Segura, will he be back? I mean, probably because of so many other moving parts, but where does he play? Do you believe in Scott Kingery? Is Segura going to? be second baseman is he going to play third base is there a spot for him that's another question mark you got a right fielder that signed for another 11 years who had another productive season 
not as consistent as you'd like, but overall no complaints. And then your other two outfield spots are kind of, they're up in the air. Do you feel like you can go another season with Roman Quinn and Adam Hazley sharing that spot? Maybe you can if you consistently have a ton of talent around the diamond elsewhere. But if you don't, if you lose some of your big pieces, then can you deal with that? And what do you do in left field? Andrew McCutcheon, still a productive player, had an okay year, 10 homers, 34 RBIs, hit 250. But Andrew McCutcheon seems to me at this point to be a guy who needs to be in an American League city. Now, if the DH is back next year, then maybe he fits this team a little better. But otherwise, I don't know that he can play the outfield for 160 games or 140 games. He might be a guy who can only play 70 or 80 games in the outfield. He's definitely starting to show his age coming off the injury. Still a productive player, and he's signed for uh, next year as an option after. So is he someone you have to eat some money and trade, or do you keep him? So there's a ton of question marks. Obviously, the bench. The bench is the bench. You have Andrew Knapp, who you know we've historically given a hard time to, but he actually had by far his best season. And outside of that, I mean, you have an Adam Hazley and the rest of them will probably not be back. So a lot of question marks there in the lineup. Any thoughts on the uh, lineup, Ed? Well, if they lose some of these guys, like, for instance, if they lose JT Romuto, Andrew Knapp's your starting catcher next year. They have nobody really in the minors to replace him. So and I think that's the other to- rough part is if you sign someone, like, Romuto is going to get five or six years. I would say they probably could have gotten Romuto for, like, Five years at $24 million in the offseason. Now he'll probably, because there's going to be so many suitors, he'll probably get six years, most likely, at 25 a year at least. I mean, I if see. you look at some of these other guys who aren't as good, what they signed for, like, you're going to, if you end up signing another catcher because you don't think Andrew Knapp's your starting catcher, like, you're going to have to give someone else 12 or $14 million a year for three or four years, like, for a lesser player. That's one of the problems. And I you trade it. Both. I mean, we talked about trading Sixto Sanchez, which, listen, if the Phillies got Real Muto and he's long-term and maybe they won a championship with him, you forget about it. It's not a big deal. If you only have him for two years and Sixto Sanchez ends up having winning a few Cy Youngs or becoming a Hall of Fame type of pitcher or something like that, you're going to be kind of sick to your stomach. And you have to remember, you did also trade Jorge Alfaro, who, while he's not great, maybe never will be a star, Still a pretty productive major league player at a very cheap cost. He didn't cost much of anything, you know, round, league minimum, maybe slightly more. This year he did miss a lot of time, so he didn't get a lot of time on the field. But going back to 2019, he had 18 homers, 60 RBIs. I think he hit 250, 260, so you got some offensive production from him, and you gave that up. So, you know, that's part of the depth issue. You have nothing else really in the minor league system catcher-wise. Yeah, I could see either the Yankees or the Mets probably giving him four to five years for maybe thirty million, and I, I really, I'm struggling to see how the Phillies are going to be able to match that, or going to be able to compete with a offer of that level. So, like I said, it was a gross, awful miscalculation by Clintac in the front office to not lock this guy up beforehand because you never you never never want to see a player of that caliber go to free agency that's why a smart like teams will trade away the talent at least to get something in return if they know that they can't financially be able to retain that guy you saw the red sox do that with mookie Betts. they had to trade him away because they knew when he hit the free agency market they weren't going to be able to afford him so it's just, uh, it's just, it's just such a tough pill to, to to take as a fan. Yeah, it's not ideal. It's it's a little frustrating. But I would say the biggest bright spot. I want to focus on some. I want I want to try to speak on some of the positives because even though it was kind of dreadful for the Phillies this year, there there were some positives out there and. I think the biggest positive was definitely, without question, Alec Bohm. He really impressed me uh, getting his opportunity, getting called up. 
I know a lot of the fans were calling for him to start with the team and were really excited to get an opportunity to see him play. He came up, I think, the third week of the season, and he really, really impressed. Put the ball in play a lot, you know, good uh, opposite field, uh, gap power, uh, was getting a lot of doubles, a lot of extra base hits, getting on base at a great clip, really, really sound approach to hitting. Uh, only thing, defense defense was a little shaky, but, you know, he's not a natural third baseman, so I think he'll get better at it. And uh, he was shoring it up the final, the final weeks of the season. He was getting a lot better. And I think going forward with Alec Bohm, if he can develop his power more, maybe, uh, you know, instead of a, a few more doubles, try to get a couple more homers, this the sky's the limit for him maybe. Maybe he could be the next premier player for the Phillies, and I, I certainly hope he is because they certainly need a player of his caliber, especially in the infield, since there's so many question marks with potentially losing D.D. DeGorius and then the uncertainty with Reese Hoskins and even the uncertainty with a guy like Scott Kingery who didn't really show you too much this year. And I know he had the COVID, uh, he had the coronavirus, and then he got into camp late and there was a lot of issues going on with him. Uh, he showed glimpses this year as well, but there's just tons of question marks for the Phillies in the infield as well. But thankfully they at least got one, uh, big beacon of light there with Alec Bohm. Yeah. The Kingery thing is weird. Um, it, it's hard to know what to even think. Uh, obviously he made the team that one year out of uh, a couple years ago out of spring training played great kind of surprised people. Everyone thought, Hey, he ain't going to come up till May. They decided to give him the big league contract. And then they, I, I don't know if I've ever seen a player more mismanaged in franchise history. I mean, it's great to have versatile players, but this is a guy who played second baseman virtually his entire career. And next thing you know, he's playing all over the place. That was part of the Gabe Kapler experiment. Like in 2018, he played games at shortstop, third base, ton at shortstop, mostly at third base, or at shortstop, I should say. Played second base, left field, right field, center field. He pitched. 2019, they bounced him between center field, third base, shortstop, second base, left field, right field. It was like, what is going on? And this year, he was going to be the second baseman, and he did play there for a little while. And then next thing you know, they're tossing him back out into the outfield. And obviously, yeah, he never really got to consistently get things going this year. He unfortunately, you know, got hurt a few times, missed a few games here and there, so never got that consistency. I mean, his projections were uh, like 16 homers, 50 RBIs, and to hit like 270, he ended up having three homers, six RBIs, and hit 159 and 113 at bat. So last year he wasn't terribly consistent, but he got kind of his feet under him a little bit and, uh, you know, fell just shy of 20 homers and hit 258. I mean, so he was uh, ways off this year. But it's kind of a mystery now because he's now three years into his career. We're not, we're no longer talking about a rookie. So we'll see where his future is as well. Like he's kind of he's kind of a total enigma if you think about it because you want to see this you want to see Kingery get you know you want to see him play every day in 162 get his three to four hundred at bats and you know see what type of player he truly is and for him to play one sole position every single day and just see how he can be in a full season with playing in a sole position not having to like you mentioned I, I know Gabe when Gabe Kapler was the manager he played him in every single position but first base and catcher. So, I mean, he was all over the place, no consistency, not knowing going to the ballpark where where you're going to be or what you're going to do that day, where you're hitting in the lineup or, or whatever. So it was kind of wild for him. But, you know, like you mentioned, this is going to be his fourth year in 2021. So, I mean – eventually push is going to come to shove and he's going to have to show that he belongs. 
And this year, he had it real rough. He did. He could not really produce. He did hit a few homers for the Phillies. I think he had. I think he did hit a a couple. Ga- had a couple game winning RBIs for the Phillies. So he did win us a few games, but it was real rough for him this year. And in 2021, I'm not sure what the plan for Kingery is going to be. I'm assuming he's going to be their starting second baseman, but it's possible, but who knows? That's the other question. Like if they do hire a new GM and team president, that's when things could change a little more. Obviously there's going to be changes regardless. There's changes every off season, but you suddenly bring in a new philosophy. That's where, you know, a new GM's not necessarily married to all the same players or they don't feel that, uh, whether you want to call it a nostalgic feeling to the homegrown players. So we will see what happens with that. Obviously, when we talk about individual team player performances and team performances, we are aware that it was a 60 game pandemic shortened season. But the biggest disappointment is when you have, you know, a team of this caliber with these expectations and you have expanded postseason with a few additional teams, like if you can't qualify for the playoffs, that's a problem. And like we said earlier, the biggest problem was the pitching staff, specifically the bullpen. Uh, starting wise, going forward, they look solid with Nola, Wheeler, and Eflin. They all look like good, solid big league pitchers. Obviously, Wheeler and Nola with the expectations even a little higher. You d- you are going to have to fill two more spots in the rotation. You're going to need some depth, some other guys that could potentially help you out there. Jake Arrieta is going to be uh, out of town for sure. He won't be back. Vince Velasquez, I mean, I think that experiment is probably ready to move on. I do think he would have some level of trade value because he does have a great arm and he still has the potential. If Vince Velasquez in a year or two ended up pitching in an all-star game, I wouldn't be shocked. He has that type of ability. It's whether he can ever put it together. There's times he looks dominating for three innings and then, you know, just falls apart. But I I think it might be time to move on from him. Spencer Howard was not – he wasn't overly impressive, but at the same time, it's his, you know, first 24 innings in the big leagues, and he definitely has a ton of ability. So I'm I'm perfectly happy having him in the rotation, but you're going to have to add another arm in that rotation for sure a good solid arm that you can anticipate and expect the six, seven innings out of on a, uh, you know, weekly basis. So we'll see what happens with the rotation. You definitely need a spot or two, but it's the bullpen. The bullpen, I personally, just from the stench of this year and knowing that they are the biggest reason that this team collapsed down the stretch and missed out on the postseason, I would cut bait with virtually everyone personally, uh, if I were running the team. Connor Brogdon, definitely a good young pitcher with a lot of ability. Been some comparisons to a Ryan Madsen type. Absolutely keep him. Virtually everyone else, even Hector Neris. Hector Neris has ability, but he also, I mean, we've seen him give up a ton of home runs over the last few years. I personally have seen enough to know he's never going to be a dominating closer. He could be effective and good in the bullpen. I think he's got trade value. I'd probably move on from him. Tommy Hunter, these other guys, I mean, Adam Morgan, cut him loose. He'll probably be in an independent league before you know it or, uh, you know, calling it a career. Brandon Workman, you know, at the time I was okay with the move. I thought, you know what, this guy's got ability to help. I mean, he might have single-handedly cost the Phillies the uh, a postseason appearance. Absolutely pathetic performance by Brandon Workman. Without question. David Hale. I mean, Jojo Romero, he's young enough. I certainly wouldn't have an issue with him uh, coming back, being a lefty. But the rest of these guys, I mean, David Phelps, I saw that they're probably going to pick up his option because it's $4 million, which is technically cheap for a reliever. And again, he's got good ability, but he was atrocious. And the rest of these guys, forget it. Like, I don't need to ever see Cole Irvin in a Phillies uniform again. All these guys, like, just... Ranger Suarez? Just... I mean, Suarez has some ability, but again, I, I'm cool with cleaning house. Um, technically, Jose Alvarez was really good again for the Phillies this year. Uh, he's been really solid the last two years, but unfortunately, he took a took a shot off the uh, you know right between the legs, and that cost him the rest of his season. So he he was a bit of a loss. But the bullpen's Blake atrocious. Parker. They're going to need to develop young arms 
power arms for the bullpen, and they're going to need to find a way to acquire, whether it's trade or free agency. But absolutely pathetic. I believe the team ERA out of the bullpen was over seven, which is embarrassing. And if you look at the stat lines, like you hop on baseball reference, they have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine guys who pitched for the Phillies this year with the Phillies had ERAs over 10, nine. There's always one or two who don't pitch much, don't have a ton of ability, but nine. I mean, it's horrible. ERA is down. I think I read Hector Neris, think, four five seven. Tommy Hunter, four oh one, which makes him look good. But like, do you ever have faith when Tommy Hunter's in the game? Blake Parker was actually decent, pitched to a two eight one ERA. But Blake Parker, his ERA wasn't bad. He didn't give up a lot of his runs, but inherited runners. Anytime he came in with a guy on second base, that guy was scoring. So the stats can be deceiving. Adam Morgan, who I know is a personal favorite of yours, had a five five four ERA. Workman was just under seven. David Hale was 409. Rosso, 652. Delios Guerra, 859. Reggie McLean, who, like, honestly, when I saw him on the opening day roster, I was just like, wait, what? 506. <laughs> Horrible. The, the, the best relief pitcher. Do you know who the best relief pitcher the Phillies had this year? Was it Blake Parker? Neil Walker, baby. Two thirds of an inning. The only guy to pitch for the Phillies this year and not give up a run. And they kicked him to the curb. Obviously, that Neil Walker, that Neil Walker story. Obviously, I'm being sarcastic the with the Neil one. Walker thing, but he does technically, with no minimum innings, led the team in ERA this year. But Jose Alvarez was the best at one four two and Parker two two eight one. But yeah, Neil Walker, that was another bizarre story. There was definitely something that happened there, maybe in the clubhouse or maybe something was said because Neil Walker was pretty productive for the Phillies. He was doing pretty good as a bench player, and they DFA'd him out of the blue. I remember seeing the news story pop up on Twitter and, and, and on Comcast and thinking, wait, why did the Phillies DFA Neil Walker? He he just played in the game yesterday and, and got two hits. And then... Literally, the day that they DFA'd Neil Walker, that's when Reese Hoskins got hurt, and they could have really, really, really used Neil Walker. And they wanted, I, I think they tried to bring him back, but he elected free agency. So that was definitely a very bizarre, strange, I guess, messy divorce that went on with the Phillies and Neil Walker. Something definitely happened behind the scenes there. Yeah, it's whatever. One of the weird stories of 2020. Obviously, 2020 has been uh, a wacky year all around. And uh, definitely the same with the Phillies. Just perpetual disappointment in 2020. By the way, speaking of the bullpen, I was going to tell you this when you were reading off some of the statistics. I remember seeing a couple days ago that the average hitter facing the Phillies bullpen has the same average slugging percentage and on base percentage as Joe DiMaggio. So basically anyone facing any random hitter that faced a, a member of the Phillies bullpen, they would have the same app. They would hidden wise. They would have the same average slugging percentage and on base percentage as one of the legends of the game in Joe DiMaggio. That's how, Bad the Phillies bullpen was at making even the most average major leaguers this year in baseball look incredible. So it's just some of the numbers are absolutely mind blown when you look at the bullpen. And yet again, the one responsible for this entire ordeal, Mr. Matt Clintack, the Phillies front office, nothing has happened. There has been no accountability. And you mentioned Mickey Moniak, who I was happy to see reach the majors because I was convinced for a period of time he would never play in the majors with the uh, Phillies. So, I mean, at least that's a positive. At least we can say, hey, he was a Philadelphia Philly, unlike guys like Cornelius Randolph. And they have a horrific history of first-round picks, like just pathetically bad. Anthony Hewitt, some of these guys, just terrible. But you look at that draft – the most productive player to this point out of that draft, I would say, was 
Kyle Lewis, who I remember at one point here in the Phillies were talking about taking. Uh, he obviously had an excellent 2020 campaign. You have a guy like Nick Senzel, who's made at least some level of an impact on Major League Baseball to this point. Gavin Lux. Uh, some pitchers. Ian Anderson. He's been really good in his short career with the Atlanta Braves. And there's a ton of other guys who've uh, kind of come up. Justin Dunn. He's with the Mariners. And uh, the Phillies have Mickey Moniak, who, who certainly didn't look ready. He's 22 years old. I mean, I, I really doubt he's more than uh, a depth outfielder in the major leagues, but I guess we'll we'll see. Did you see anything out of Mickey Moniak that made you uh, a believer? I, I was glad to see him get the call because I know of our track record with, as you mentioned, with first-round picks. So it was cool to see him get called up. He did get, I think, like two to three hits. I think they really just brought him up because they needed a they needed an outfielder. They had literally nobody to play the outfield because at the time Hazley was hurt, Roman Quinn was hurt. I think McCutcheon was nurse was nursing an injury, so they needed somebody. So they 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 gave Mickey Moniak the call, and uh, you could tell he was not. You could tell like he just wasn't ready for like he didn't his skills weren't up, up to par for the major league level. He did get, I give him credit. He played, he, uh, he played okay defense. He did get a couple hits, but you can tell, uh, especially during certain at bats, he was definitely, uh, it was a, a huge miss mismatch. He, it was pretty apparent. I mean, it is good to see Alec Bohm up. He was drafted in 2018 as the Phillies, First round pick, third overall. So that's, uh, you know, certainly a good sign there. And hopefully he'll uh, continue. And it, it's amazing how quick the uh, ascent in the majors has been for a lot of guys to these recent drafts. Um, probably this year because there was so much kind of turnover and need. And there was no minor league system. So it wasn't like they were getting a chance to play in the minors. Um, just this year alone, Casey Mize from that draft, the first three, first four picks all uh, made their major league debuts from 2018. Casey Mize with Detroit, Joey Bart with the Giants, along with Alec Boehm and Nick Madrigal for the White Sox. And then Brady Singer came up and uh, pitched pretty well overall for Kansas City. So, and Nico Horner as well. So, very interesting year in baseball, despite the fact that it was uh, a tad disappointing from a Phillies fan's perspective. Well, there, there was so many injuries around baseball this year, right? The, the injury bug was so rampant and probably that had a lot to do with, you know, guys not being able to get into the play in shape yet with no spring training. And, you know, baseball's a lot of, a lot of these guys are, they need their routine and uh, a lot of their routines were interrupted with all this stuff, with all the COVID and, all the regulations going on. So I think that's why we saw such a massive uptick in injuries. And usually the teams with the best def uh, have gone on to be successful. And that's why certain teams like the Rays, uh, the Yankees, uh, the Dodgers, that's why these teams really did damn good because they, they have a lot of organizational def. So they have guys to, they, they could plug in here and there. Stood out about that. Uh, real quick, Ed, want to get your thoughts. You know, we talked about the Phillies and kind of the depressing, anticlimactic, disappointing conclusion to the season. But like I said before, we're both baseball fans. We're definitely uh, still excited for the postseason, interested to see how things go, how things develop. Do you have any uh, thoughts on the postseason, any teams you like that you're uh, – kind of counting on or looking towards or what you think uh, may or may not happen? Well, the two, my World Series pick from when we did one of the videos, uh, one of the season uh, outlook videos with Bob Lewis, JT, Triple Crown, uh, and Ray from Philly, my World Series pick was the Rays, Tampa Bay Rays versus the St. Louis Cardinals. Both of those teams are still in there. 
I do really like the Rays. I think that they can, I mean, their, their bullpen is just absolutely nasty and their offense is really clicking. So I'll continue to say the Rays. I'm, I don't, like I said all the way back when, so I don't want to change my pick there. For the National League, I don't know. I'm not as confident on the Cardinals, but hey, you never know. In a three game series, maybe they might be able to do something. Uh, but surprise teams, you know, for some reason, I, I kind of like the Reds right now. Uh, their pitcher rotation is, is man, they're, they're, they're jacked. I mean, they got Trevor Bauer, who might be the Cy Young this year for the National League. He's been amazing. Uh, then they got Sonny Gray, uh, Luis, uh, Luis Castillo. So they got some... They got some really, really solid pitching. They got a pretty damn decent bullpen, and uh, they're hot right now. They're a very hot team, so we'll see what they can do. They're playing the Braves. I think that's actually a pretty decent matchup for them since the Braves are so banged up, but we'll see what happens. Uh, There's a lot of good teams in the mix. There's some surprise Cinderella teams in there. I know the Miami Marlins are in the playoffs. Uh so we'll see what happens. A lot, a lot of, a lot can happen. And the Marlins have never lost a postseason series. <laughs> They've never won a division either. Wild card. Twenty twice. twenty, baby. Twice they were the wild card, and went on to win the World Series. And this year they're a second place team. I don't even know what that's called. Second place qualifier. I don't even know what you call it. But how yeah. much would baseball? How much would baseball absolutely love it if the World Series was the Tampa Bay Rays versus the Miami Marlins? What a rated juggernaut that would be. It'd be big time. The Battle of Florida where no one cares. <laughs> no, it, it, it should be fun, though. I, I'm really excited to see some fresh blood in there, but I'm also interested in seeing the high-quality teams uh, on our previous show my teams are still alive too barely uh thanks to the phillies ineptitude the brewers kind of backed their way into the postseason and the twins so i knew i kind of didn't know what to expect this year and i think i just kind of on the whim said uh twins brewers i think the twins have a shot not saying i expect it the brewers they have a tough road ahead of them they would more than likely have to beat the uh dodgers and then the padres or cardinals so you know, we'll see about that, but I do think we're going to get a World Series that's unexpected, most likely, or not your typical World Series. Everyone's picking the Dodgers. When I see everyone pick a team, I always expect that that won't happen, so I personally don't think the Dodgers will end up winning the World Series. They're certainly the best team on paper, and they were the best team during the regular season, but I just, I feel like everyone is picking them. Probably the Dodgers would be a little frightened of the Padres should they match up with them. I think that, you know, could be tough in a best of five, but we'll see. I'm uh, I'm definitely excited to see this. All begins Tuesday with the American League wild card round. Wednesday, the National League wild card round. It'll be fun. I think you get can get a better grasp on series once you get to the best of seven, once you get that LCS and World Series round. But I, I do. I filled out a bracket for some contest thing or whatever that they were advertising on MLB.com. Of course, it didn't save right, so whatever. No, my luck, it'll end up uh, being a winner that didn't go through. But I think I have clicked through it, and I went with Tampa Bay and Cincinnati, which I think would be a fun little World Series. And we get you know, some additional vlogs from Trevor Bauer. So that'd be fun. Major League Baseball would hate it because they don't like to uh, promote the sport, but I feel like the audience would love it. That's kind of the reason why I want the Reds to go really far, too, because I really have been enjoying watching Trevor Bauer's blogs. Uh, they just been like, dude, the, the insight and the behind-the-scenes look that he's been given have been so valuable as a fan. I just love to see that behind the scenes look so i'm kind of hoping they go far too just so we can see how the bubble is for the playoff teams and what the procedures are and what the day-to-day life is in that uh mlb bubble as uh someone who enjoys the occasional uh the occasional bet being placed now that it's legal in the state of pennsylvania 
any uh, series that stand out to you? Did you check out any of this, the uh, series lines or anything or any team that you're going to toss on just kind of for fun? Because when we get to the playoffs for baseball, I usually bet on most series, even if it's just a couple bucks, just kind of for that additional push or just kind of for fun. Because if you're tossing some $5 bets, you're not going to you're not going to win a lot. You're not going to lose a lot, but you can have fun with it. Uh, actually, my one bet from January is still in effect, although I don't think it's going to be a winner. Uh, back in January, I put 20 bucks before all this COVID sh- stuff happened and everything went to hell in a handbasket. I put 20 bucks on the Toronto Blue Jays to win the World Series, and I think they were plus like 10000 So that's like, uh, like a $2,000 ticket, potentially, if they win. Because uh, at the time, I was just so high on their young core of uh, Vladdy Jr., Bo Bichette, and Kevin Biggio. I was like, man, they could really make some noise. Unfortunately, I think they're playing the Yankees. They're so. playing Tampa Bay. So. Oh, they're playing Tampa Bay. It uh, is a tough matchup because Tampa is so good, but it is a divisional matchup. So, I mean, these teams play best at three series all the time. To me, like those are kind of coin flips, to be honest. But the, the the Blue Jays have been playing so poorly recently, though, Mike. I just hey, you never know. I, you, you, that, that's true. Miracles can happen. That's true. Can you imagine if tw- they beat Tampa and then they beat the Yankees and then at that point they just beat up on? They're so confident they just destroy whoever they play in the LCS. If the that Buffalo did happen, the Blue Jays in the World Series against the Miami Marlins that'd be another uh, you know legendary matchup that Major League Baseball would be not too happy about if that happened the word hedge 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 comes right to my mind right to the forefront (laughs) uh on something like that but uh a couple other you were asking for other bets the only other action i have series wise is i have uh 25 dollars on the race to win the world series since that was my since that was my pick that i made on the vlog uh, back in whenever we did our season outlook with Bob, uh, JT, and Ray, because I figured, hey, I picked I picked the Rays all that all that long time ago. Like it would kind of be foolish not to uh, have a bet on them, and uh, also put a uh, fifteen bucks on the on the Reds to win the World Series. So those were the only three teams that I bet on, and we'll see what happens. It'll be fun. Postseason baseball is always fun to watch. Sometimes it's fun to put a little action on a single game or a series, but it's early in the process still. I mean, if there's a underdog that someone really likes, you can always toss something on them now because you'll get some crazy. I think I did throw a few bucks on Cincinnati just for the hell of it. Like even to win the um, the league, to win the pennant, you know, pays out I think pretty decent. Plus fifteen hundred for the for pennant. even like a five dollar bet. I mean pay out okay but it's fun i'm excited for it and we'll see what happens this off season of magic baseball a lot of unknowns with 2021 philly's got a lot of work to do we have no idea who's going to be running the ship we have no idea who's going to be back who's not who the replacements will be and quite honestly we really don't know for sure what the 2021 baseball season will entail will there be fans in the stands if so will it be packed houses or will it be a limited capacity that stuff all could play a role in the type of contracts that teams are willing to uh, hand out. So we will see. Ed, if you have any final thoughts, now would be the time. We've had a nice 58, 59 minute discussion. So it was a good time chatting about Major League Baseball and the Phillies in our uh, just off the cuff podcast that we decided to uh, randomly do because, well, we wanted to chat about the conclusion of the Philly season. If we did this last night, we might have been screaming and yelling and cursing a little more, but we gave it 24 hours to marinate. I think we both knew that regardless of whether the Phillies got in the postseason or not, they likely wouldn't go far, but you always want to see your team in the postseason, a chance to extend that season, and who knows, maybe just make some postseason memories, even if it's just for a game or a series or two, but it is what it is, 2020. Can you imagine if the World Series winner in 2020 is the Houston Astros? Bang, bang, baby. Fans will not be happy. 
they will be very much rooted against. And they're, they actually had a pretty poor year. I think they ended up finishing two games under 500, but they qualified as a second place team. So they're taking on the Minnesota Twins. We'll see. It'd be nice to see the Twins, you know, win a series or two this year. They got a shot. Their little bracket's not too bad. Twins, Astros, and then Athletics and the White Sox. So I think the Twins could, uh, you know, win a couple series maybe. We'll see. It should be fun. I'm definitely looking forward to some postseason baseball. Uh, even though the Phillies aren't in it and, you know, we said our piece on the Phillies, but I am looking forward as a baseball fan to – Seeing the postseason unfold, there's tons of great matchups, and it should definitely be interesting. I hope we are in for some classic uh, fall season moments, definitely. All right, everyone, thanks for listening. Uh, check out Wesker Griff on YouTube if you're into the YouTube thing. He talks about a little bit of everything, shows off his baseball, basketball, football card collections, his uh, other random stuff, his Guy Fieri collection, his... The, the show with the dragons and stuff. My award-winning lectures. Yeah, lectures, all kinds of great stuff. And I'm over on YouTube, Mike I have a few channels, but my active channel is Mike talking about sports cards, baseball cards specifically. So we'll talk sports on there from time to time. Mike O, baseball, car, baseball blog, whatever, whatever we're posting this on. Uh, hope, hopefully get some more content up from time to time. Maybe uh, at some point some postseason predictions we'll see all right guys thank you for listening talk to you next time have a great one